Chapter 4 Dangers of the Journey It was a month later again, and we were finally in space. The engines were propelling us away from Earth at a speed of 33,000 kilometers per second. An amazing speed by any standards, but just only of a tenth of light speed. Our engines were capable of much more, but it would be ill-advisable to go at that speed now, as we needed to keep the charge for the jump. It was our finest achievement, a jump drive capable of folding space-time, moving the fabric of space to us in an instant, instead of us having to go to it over countless years. The speed we were going at now was almost right for the jump, with the captain making constant adjustments to maintain the speed. The technology involved in this was incredible. We did not have a money-based economy, as so many of the nations had, but rather an ideas-based one, with those who had the greatest working ideas being afforded the highest positions in society, wealth-wise. Each citizen had a currency, or as we called it, credit, with its worth being determined by that citizen's input to the society as a whole. The emperor's credit being the base of the currency. Therefore, we had never suffered foolish leaders, as this would devalue the entire economy. This system allowed us to progress at an astounding rate, although the people of disabled or lesser ability often suffered as a result. Nartinia had changed this, with his social reform programs bringing in support for those who could not support themselves out of the credits of the top ten worth. This has brought him much popularity from the people, and had won him their respect. I sighed heavily, my cousin's face flashing before my eyes. Was there not anything I could have done to help him? It was now time to begin. I was standing on the bridge along with all the others. For the last two months, I had been stuck in my study, reading through the text over and over, studying it and allowing it to permeate my soul. Today, we would begin the fold. The ship was designed by my cousin Gaius and Burton the eccentric. Burton had felt my cousin's death more sharply than even I, and had been closed in his cabin for the entire time, only accepting a few visitors, and then only for a few short minutes. It is the loss of these two crucial members at this time that probably caused what was about to happen. Not to say that it wasn't necessary, but it is simply interesting to see how God works things occasionally. I was really excited. The inner researcher in me had longed for this day, and now it was about to happen. Nartinia stood up and turned to face us all. It has been tradition amongst our people to speak in flowery speech when addressing the emperor, and for I, the emperor, to do the same when addressing you. I propose on this day to mark the occasion that this is redacted and made void. This was met with general laughter, as we all knew how much Nartinia hated the practice. Very well then, since you all seem to agree, let's get this thing going. Captain? Yes, your excellence. Start the engines. Yes, your excellence. The captain reached down and, waiting for the emperor to once again secure himself in a seat, pressed the button. Colours began to blur together, and then they began shifting between the red and blue spectrum. Sounds became muted and then disappeared entirely. It was a silence unlike I had ever known. I could not even hear the blood in my ears or the beating of my own heart. Suddenly, the entire ship shuddered and a mammoth crash was heard. It was deafening. The sudden sound to our silence-filled ears was incredibly painful, and I felt blood leak out of my right ear. We were all deafened for the moment, the only sound being a sharp ringing. Something had gone wrong. I searched the control panel for the solution. I flipped on the comm switch. Slowly, my hearing was returning to me. What the Neshne just happened? came Nartinia's voice through the comms link. The doubling dynamizer mass has come loose in sector 5 quadrant B9.2, causing a wrinkle in the fold, replied the captain, his voice sounding most concerned. You mean we are inside the fold? Yes, sir. The only thing keeping us in one piece is the manifold isolator Burton installed. Call Burton. To the bridge. Right now. We need to get this thing fixed. I am already here, your excellence. I came as soon as the shuddering ceased. I'm afraid that the only way to fix the dynamizer is to send a man outside the ship to re-secure it to the hull, 
although once it is re-secured, the ship will complete the jump, and the man would instantly be spread over all the space that the ship has just jumped through, which would be most painful and most certainly result in him losing his life. I will go. I am the Emperor. It is my responsibility to ensure the safety of my people. No, Your Majesty. The people will need you to lead them in the new world. I will go instead, came Augustus's voice. Your Majesty, came the voice of the captain. The outer hatch of quadrant B 9.2 has been opened. A person is leaving the entry hold. Who would? Wait. Where is Maximus? I shifted my floating body around, securing the cable to the ship before jumping off the side and floating towards the loose dynamizer. The space around me was a turbulent mass of colour and space, all colliding against the field around the ship, but none of it infiltrating the barrier, fortunately, for my sake. The comms died as the interference grew too great, and I finally reached the dynamizer. I began to re-secure it with a finesse only available to human hands. I felt the ship shudder once again as I completed the process and cut the cable behind me, and let the darkness embrace my vision, as inside I looked towards my lord. My name is Matthias, friend of Maximus. I use this title with honour. In the two weeks since Maximus' sacrifice, he had become a hero among the people. Although already well liked, after sacrificing his life so selflessly, for all aboard the ship, he had become a hero and a legend. Although his face haunted my dreams, I took solace that he was with the Lord he loved so much. Myself, I did not have such hopes for the end of my days. I was not so pure. These hands of mine had seen blood and had stood against the truth more times than I could wish. Now I was trying my best to hold the ship together. The Emperor was doing his best, but we could all see the toll that losing Maximus had had on him. He had tightened security on all exits, irrationally, since the threat was now past, and was constantly having the captain scan the nearby space for any life signs. Needless to say, there had been none. I had done my best to comfort Nidara and Liaren, but both were inconsolable. Nidara was putting on a brave face and had taken Maximus's position in the Senate, although she seemed to have aged. Her face was drawn and haggard, and her eyes had dark circles that no makeup could hide. None of us ever saw her crying or ever heard her mention a word of pain, but we could all see what effect Maximus's passing had had on her. The state of belief after his act shifted violently once again, with some using it to further their view that it was dangerous, bolstering their arguments with both Gaius's and Maximus's deaths. Others yet took it as a showing of true dedication and glory that one should give his life for many, as this was what the Lord had done, and in Maximus doing so, he had brought truth to his words. Myself, I was divided. The evidence presented by both Augustus and Maximus was compelling, though my years of conditioning towards despising belief in a higher power in all its forms often haunted me. Perhaps the staunchest supporter that arose was young Seth. He often held heated debates in the Senate and called all those who would to turn. I often saw crowds of people surround him afterward, and others yet would come to Augustus or Masake as they stood Senate. I walked down to the observation hall on this day alone. Today was the day when we would see our new home for the first time. The jump had landed us some distance from the planet, so that the ripples it caused would mellow out before reaching the planet. We did not want to disturb the space-time of the planet we were about to colonize. There had been much debate over what to call the new planet, and after much thought, we had decided on Terra Sparrow, or Earth's Hope. A fanciful name, to be sure, but one that sounded nice on the tongue. I reached the viewing wing. It was full today. I saw Augustus, Nottenia, Loctar, and Makael standing a very short distance away, and began walking towards them. Although I still had my reservations about the faith, they did not treat me any different, and greeted me warmly as we all found places to sit. The wall in front of us shimmered, and then disappeared, and in its place, a view of a field of stars came in. The largest was a blue-green and had four others in orbit. As we watched it grew larger and we saw that it was no star at all, 
but a planet with four moons. One glowing red with lava, one an icy blue, one a shining golden, and another shining silver. The planet itself dwarfed the moon several times over. It looked like Earth, but with all the continents in different sizes and shapes. We had to been told that Terra Spera was the size of Earth, and with how close it looked to our home, I'm sure there was not a single dry eye in the entire room. Shaking us from our awe was the sound of sirens and a voice coming over comms. All to report to positions, life form identified in 9532.59 beta. Repeat, all to preset positions. Nartinia sprang up, and I saw Nidara grab Lioran's arm as they both rushed towards the deck. It couldn't be. No one could survive that, could they? Well, I guess if anyone could, it would be that old man. I saw colours above me. They swam through the sky without any care. They slowly reconciled into stars and nebula as my vision cleared. Was I not dead? I felt sturdiness below me. It was grass below me, slightly wet, as if with the morning dew. Wait. I lifted my head and looked at myself. Yes, I was unclothed. My head fell back down against the ground. My body looked young, like that of a thirty-year-old man. I pulled myself upright and looked around me. Nothing but an endless star-filled sky and an endless grass plain in all directions. Had what I believed been false? Was I now dead, and was this what awaited me? I saw two lights in the distance, slowly swaying and growing larger. Looking down, I had discovered that I was in some sort of road. I looked around me desperately for some clothing, only to find that I was garbed in some animal skins. I breathed a sigh of relief as I saw that the lights that were approaching belonged to a donkey wagon, being pulled by two of the beasts. It was filled with all sorts of trinkets and baubles, and at its helm sat an old man with a long white beard. He wore a long hat and had a ragtag appearance. He brought up the cart to a stop alongside me. Ah, so you're the fellow he was talking about then. I tried to answer, but my mouth would not open. All right, he made me make these for you. Here we go, he said, turning around to shuffle in the back, before producing two boxes, one small and coloured gold. It was resting on top of the other, which was a pearl silver and much larger. Well then, I'll be off. I looked up to protest, but the lights of his cart were already far away, and the road underneath me had become grass once again. I sat down and noticed I was wearing my usual clothes. I reached for my pocket and found my diary there along with a pen. I began to write a description of the boxes. The first was golden and had an elegant embossing all the way around it. Upon it was the word Elatestae, or rings. The second was larger and contained the words Lacadna Lacleta, or bearer of truth. I sat for a while, not sure what to do. I noticed the boxes were hinged, so I began to look for a latch then stopped. If they weren't for me, I shouldn't open someone else's property. I soon convinced myself, however, that there was no one else around, and took a look inside the top box. Inside the box, I was met with purple silk, into which was inset ten distinct rings. Under each ring, there was a nameplate. Eight of the rings were set with stones and were all golden. The other two were a spiral of gold and pearl silver, and one held a small book set into it, its pages turning ceaselessly. My eye kept telling me that the pages would reach an end, but the book would close. But it never did. Upon the other was a red sphere the colour of blood. It was encircled with a gold lace and was spinning constantly. Upon the lid of the box was a magnifying glass. I took it from its grasper and held it up to the rings. The magnification was amazing. I could see each individual atom spinning. There was something strange about these atoms, though. They were covered in what appeared to be circuitry, though circuitry this small was surely impossible. My eye caught on the diamond ring, and I lifted it from the box. It glowed faintly as I touched it, and then settled. I felt compelled to put it on, so did so. The world around me spun, and I found myself wearing different garments once again. This time, they were clothes of white, soft as light, and flowing continuously as if pulled by some unseen wind. It was too much. There was no way that the old man could still be alive. I shook my head as I watched the dot blinking on the screen. The probes had identified him. It was Maximus, and a retrieval robot had been sent out to fetch him. What was stranger, though, 
was that he was clutching two boxes in his hands. We had tried to scan them, but to no avail. They returned no results and seemed impervious to visual capture, as when we tried to record them, all that had been returned on the film had been a white light where the boxes should have been. In fact, the only reason we knew they were boxes is that we could make them out from the telescope on the bridge. Nidara had never looked so radiant as she stood there, her eyes glued to the monitors, waiting for the bot to make contact with Maximus. I smiled and thought of Maiki, who was waiting back in the cabin for me. My pleasant thoughts were cut off by a sudden siren and the ship shuddering. I looked at the monitors to see another scan being run, this time on the planet we were approaching. They were life forms. Billions of them. The planet was inhabited. Not only it, but three of its moons were as well. How? I had personally checked all the data. This planet was supposed to have no life except plant life. There was a mad scramble for a while, and then the ship shuddered again. Your Imperial Majesty, there are large molten rocks being shed from the Red Moon. It appears as if one of its many supervolcanoes is erupting. We must land upon this planet now, or we will sustain too much damage. Can't we blast them before they reach us? Yes, Your Excellency, but if we do, the debris will rain down upon the Silver Moon, and the life forms there. Very well, take us down. But, Maximus... Nidara gripped Nartinia's arm. I will take a shuttle and go and fetch him myself. Your Excellency, please allow me. The people need you. This came from Makael. She had stood the entire time with her arms folded and her shoulder resting against the wall. Neshle! Does being Emperor mean I can do nothing? Nartinia slammed his hand down. Very well. You are the most skilled pilot we have. Listen. Maximus solved the Letharian Code in a day, managed and organized all the kingdoms into Kaivar system, invented the fold drive, toppled the rebellion, saved my life a hundred times during that, invented phase and time shift technology, and revolutionized the entire scientific outlook on almost every aspect of society. I cannot overstate how important this man is. Nartinia leaned in closely and put his hand on Mikhail's shoulder. More than any of this, he is like a brother to me, and a loving husband and devoted father. I held off his funeral for these two weeks because I knew he was still alive, and he has proven me right. Do not prove me wrong. Mikhail's eyes were wide. In fact, mine and almost everyone else in the rooms were as well. How had we not known this about him? He had always seemed so approachable, so, so normal. Sure, he had sometimes that far-off look in his eyes that let you know he was lost in thought. But to solve the Letharian Code in a day? Scholars and mathematicians had been working on it for decades before and had given up, claiming it to have too many unsolvable variables, to be too based on random chance to have a solution. Twenty years ago, when it was announced to be solved, we had thought it had been by a group of the best. Never in a day, and never by one man. Mikhail took a deep breath saluted and said, I shall bring him back, alive. Recovery ship log, 4030-203929, Captain Mikhail Darsnet, 3392-020393832, DBT, 20022-8461, Miss 329-919. I shook my head. No wonder he had such conviction when he spoke. No wonder I believed his words so willingly. I had to save this man. Then I had to slap him. How could he so willingly throw his life away like that? We needed him. Not only had he done all this, but he had saved all of us. All 44 million of us. By what he had done two weeks ago. My hands were shaking, and the pressure of the situation was almost unbearable. I smiled. I loved this. His Excellency knew I thrived on pressure, so he had made the situation as pressure-filled as possible, so that I would succeed. And I would. I had to. My vision suddenly grew hazy as I looked around me, colours swirling once again, and I could hear a siren. It seemed to be coming from inside my head. I reached up and felt a sharp thud as the glove of my spacesuit hit the helmet. With a snap, my vision cleared, and I saw my air was dwindling. I turned the dial that controlled the siren off. It would not help me think. Looking around me, I could see nothing but open space, and the two boxes from before floating in front of me. What? 
No, this made sense, but it wasn't right. Wasn't I in a hallucination before? If so, then how did the boxes come back with me, to reality? Or was I in a hallucination now? I found the space around me to suddenly contain a planet with four moons, and the giant ship that I had helped finalize. It was floating there, seemingly still in space. It worked. I wanted to laugh, wanted to cry, wanted to dance around and scream, but none of these were viable options with my current air levels, so I settled on a smile. I pressed the beacon button to try and get their attention, but it sent no signal. It seemed I would have to wait until they noticed me. Keeping a lid on my panic so that I would not use up more air, I shifted around so that more of my body was facing the ship, thus creating a larger surface heat signature. I also fired my booster in spurts. I sent a prayer of thanks up to God, and then sent a prayer of hope for rescue. Just then, I saw a giant ball of fire propelled from the red moon crash into the ship, followed by a second only moments later. The ship seemed to take it well, but the moon was now constantly spewing these molten rocks. The ship's engines ignited and it started to head towards the planet's surface, dodging around the rocks and blasting the smaller boulders as it went. I noticed a small craft launch from it and start heading towards me. I smiled again. I had been noticed. Now, if only it could get to me before the thousands of life-ending molten rocks could. I turned my boosters to full and angled them to propel me towards the craft. The fuel soon ran out, but the inertia helped to continue to propel me forward. I saw flying like I didn't think possible, as the teardrop-shaped craft bobbed and weaved through the debris, maintaining an insane speed towards me. It sent out an arm and stopped itself in space. It was about 15 meters from me. I saw a flash and suddenly found myself colliding with the gravity barrier, which cancelled out my inertia. Just then, though, I also saw a flaming rock heading straight for me. The arm grabbed me and pulled me into the craft, just as I was beginning to feel the heat from the boulder. Wow, that had been close. I sat up and removed my helmet. Once I had the green light flash through the room, I now found myself in. I took a deep breath, sighed, and began to laugh like a madman. It had been a week since landing on the planet. We had decided to land where there were no life forms detected, an island we called Solarium. That there were life forms at all was a surprise indeed. All prior scans had shown no signs of life, and we had had some of our best working on them, my cousin included. The joy at my return was most unexpected. I expected it from my wife and child, of course, and somewhat from Nartinia, but everyone was now looking at me with a respect and almost awe that I did not like in the least. I had worked hard all these years to maintain a low profile. How could I get anything done with people around me all the time? Speaking of that, Mikael, although I will always be grateful for the rescue of my life, seemed to be increasingly by my side. So much so that I eventually had to ask Nidara what to do about it. Nidara smiled, went off, and upon returning just laughed and told me to get used to it. It was truly baffling until I figured out that she had assigned herself as my bodyguard to make sure that I did not go off and do anything else silly, as she put it. Then there was the matter of the boxes. I had kept them with me at all times, and although many had asked me about them, I gave no response except to say that I would reveal them in a week. At one of the few times I found myself alone, admittedly in the washroom, I opened them to find the contents as I expected them, and the diamond ring to have the same effect upon me as before. This was truly a surprise, as this was the most unreal of all the parts of my experience. However, once the ring was on me, all doubt was cast aside. I found I could leave the ring on and return to my casual attire with a mere thought. The ring also had other unexpected results. If I thought in a particular manner, I could control the air around me ever so slightly, to the extent where I could summon a slight breeze. Today was to be the day that I held the meeting. I walked into the makeshift amphitheater that had been erected for this occasion. Flanking me was Nidara on one side and Mikael on the other. I stood up on the platform and placed the two boxes in front of me. Thank you all so much for coming here today, and to all of those who are watching from home, thank you for your time. I am sure you are all most curious about these two boxes. Unfortunately, I know very little about them myself. While I was caught in the rift, they were given to me by an old man riding a donkey cart. At this, there was some laughter as people assumed me to be joking. While this does sound ridiculous, I must say it is the only truth I have to give you. 
I have since been studying these via the use of this. I held up the magnification lens. With this, I am able to see smaller things than even our strongest microscopes. I have been able to perceive that these boxes and what they contain are not solid objects, but are made up of countless of tiny drones smaller than an atom. In fact, so much smaller that over a million of them can fit on each atom that makes up these objects. There was much noise at this. Please, I must ask for quiet. I will now open the first box. The crowd grew silent, and I saw some of them shift towards the edge of their seats. I lifted the lid and held it up for the cameras to capture. Within this box, as you can see, are ten rings. Each, though beautiful, are extremely powerful, as I shall now demonstrate. I reached for the diamond ring and slipped it onto my finger. The now familiar breeze whipped up around me and transformed my garb to that of white robes and made me hover over the surface of the ground. I lifted my hand and blew a breeze across the crowd. Those who had been sceptical now sat with mouths wide open. I saw a movement out of the corner of my eyes. Some people from the crowd were moving to steal the rings. No, they... I was too late. Some were stopped by Mikael, and although their limbs were broken, they were the lucky ones. The ones who had reached the box were now piles of smoking bones. Please, no one else try that, I shouted. The box has a self-defense mechanism, and so do its contents. It seems to have some form of sentience too. It will not allow any to touch it that it does not recognize or accept. I should have... Do not take the blame for the greed of others upon yourself, Maximus, said Augustus. Their deaths are on their own heads. Please continue. I sighed. Very well. I moved towards the podium. The bones had already turned to ash, and I carried that ash into a small pot on the side of the amphitheatre with a breeze. Within this larger box are belts called Lacadna Lacleta. They magnify the power of the ring when worn in conjunction with it. I lifted one of the eight and held it up. I do not know why there are eight belts, but ten rings, but this belt corresponds to the ring I wear. I fastened it around my waist and, inserting my fingers into the holes on the surface, twisted it. A light shone around me and instantly I was in a suit of shining white armour with gold trimming. From my back were wings of silver and from the base of my palms blades a metre and a half long each. I stretched the wings out and flapped. I took to the air more gracefully than any bird. I was flying. It was amazing. I felt so free, so... Wait, the presentation... I soared back down and landed upon the stage. As you can see, the belt comes with its own armour and wings. I don't know if this is true for each, because they will not allow me to wear them. They do not kill me when touched, but they act simply as if the belt will ring and nothing more. My theory is that there are others to whom they will connect. Do not worry if you are nervous to try. You can just approach the box. You will know if you have a connection. It will feel as if the ring is calling to you, or at least it did for me. If you do not get that feeling, or are not sure, please do not reach out for a ring or a belt, as you will meet the same fate as these poor people. Mikael came forward first, put her hand straight in the box, and slipped on the sapphire ring. Her appearance changed to a younger one, just as mine had, and she was clothed in a blue robe, seemingly as fluid as water. After putting on the belt, she was armoured in an armour of dazzling blue, with the same gold trim as mine, although she did not have wings. She looked around and suddenly turned into a cloud and floated up into the air, landing back down much quicker than I had, I must admit, solidifying once again. In her hand was a long spear with a deadly edge. The ring finding, as it became known, took another two months, during which, despite my warnings, many had died. All the belts now had owners except one, and all the rings except three. The rings and their belts had been claimed by Matthias Nare, who now had the crystal ring and power over light. Augustus Jule, who had the ruby ring and power over fire. Loktar Hempstead, who had the emerald ring and power over plants. Masake Durin, who had the pearl ring and power over electricity. And Seth Tarste, who had the topaz ring and power over rock and earth. It was now Nartinia's turn. He had insisted on being last to give his people the first choice in the rings. He reached forward and put on the steel ring. Instantly, his appearance youthened, and he wore robes of seemingly liquid metal. He took the last belt out and twisted. His armour was twice the size of ours, and he stood like a giant among us. Even Steth, 
who was normally tall, was dwarfed next to him. We stood there, all eight of us, and bowed to our knees. Now was the time to take the oath I had prepared, and we spoke it in unison. We, the bearers of rings and the belts, bear them not for our own glory or power. We do so for the glory and power of God above. We, the bearers of the rings and the belts, bear them not for our own ease. We do so for the ease of God's people below. We, the bearers of the rings and the belts, bear them not as a right. We do so as a responsibility to protect whom God will. We, the bearers of the rings and the belts, swear to serve God and his people in whatever way and capacity we can, no matter the sacrifice or pressure. Glory to God in the highest, hallowed be thy name. Heaven bows down to your glory, planetary might is in vain. Heaven and planets exalt you, rocks proclaim your praise. Planetary glory is like dust compared to you, O Prince of Peace, Mighty One. Counselor, closest friend, King of all creation, yet you call us friend. Holy, holy, exalted above all else. Glorious O you, O King of Love, most exalted High Counsel and Friend. We will worship thee and bow to none but thee all the days of our lives, and we will stand in awe of your presence all the days of our lives, and we will be with you in glory forever and ever. Amen.